And it's wonderful to see you all here. I'm Ragesh Tongari. For those who don't know me, I'm the president of the board of the Historical Society, the Northern District Historical Society. And I am very, very pleased to be presiding over this uh, ceremony today. This is one of the very nicest events we get to do, every, well, hopefully every year. It, it hasn't been every year for a while, and we're hoping that it will be every year in the future because we get to honor an exceptional lawyer from our district who exemplifies the highest traditions of legal practice in our district. And I will just say, without stealing the thunder of any of the great speakers who are going to come after me, that it's a special privilege and pleasure for me to be presiding over this particular award ceremony because I, of course, had the privilege of working with John for a number of years and can attest that I can think of nor imagine no more deserving recipient of this award than, than, than the one we have tonight. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over first to Michael Abraham, who's going to talk a bit about Bill Edland and whose name this award is given and why that is. And then I will be back to introduce our next speakers. Michael. Thank you, Rakesh. Bill Edlin was born on August 31st, 1929. He graduated from Stanford and earned his law degree at Berkeley in 1953. His state bar number was 25,013. Shortly after graduation, Bill joined the law firm then known as Pillsbury, Madison, and Sucre. San Francisco, where he practiced law for 43 years. He then joined my law firm, Bartko, Zankel, Bunzel, and Miller, where he practiced for an additional 17 years. Bill frequently mentioned that he liked to change firms about once every 40 years. At Pillsbury, Bill rose to be one of the premier litigation leaders of their litigation groups, where he spearheaded significant antitrust litigation, securities, and other high-stake litigation. While at Bart Goes and Kel, Bill was one of the most active members of our firm. Like Theodore Roosevelt, Bill believed that life was no, had no greater reward than hard work worth doing. He was skilled and a gifted lawyer who left no stone unturned in pursuit of his clients' causes and in pursuit of justice. When preparing briefs, he would engage in deep dives into the legislative history, as well as contact the authors of treatises cited by the opposition. In one manner, in support of a Daubert motion, Bill was able to obtain a declaration from the treatise author stating that the opposition's expert had cited the treatise for the wrong proposition. Every writing needed to be edited at least four times and more often seven times before Bill considered it ready. Bill's excellence in writing was matched by his excellence in oral advocacy. His noteworthy contributions included Timberland Company versus Bank of America, a 1976 Ninth Circuit case, establishing a standard for extraterritorial antitrust jurisdiction and the application of the act of state doctrine. Another matter uh, that Bill was lead counsel on is Chevron Corporation versus Pennzoil, 1992, representing Chevron in a leading case on the intent in Schedule 13B disclosures. In Stilson versus Reader's Digest, a leading U a California decision, uh, representing the publisher in the leading case on rejection of class actions in evasions of privacy, a decision that's dear to my heart as I practice in defending class actions based on privacy. While Bill had many interests outside the law and regularly demonstrated his leadership in the community, he was especially committed to the Law Center to prevent gun violence. Bill was not only a founding member, he went on to serve many years on its board of directors and also a term as its president. Bill loved and was committed to the legal profession. He was a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, a director of the Bar Association of San Francisco. He was a trustee of the United States Supreme Court Historical Society. He was a long serving director of both the Northern District and Ninth Circuit Historical Societies. He was a friend and mentor to many of the judges serving on the Northern District. While Bill was a zealous advocate for his clients and relished the fight, he approached every battle with integrity and preparation. Bill would also not countenance a lack of civility and knew the difference between zealous advocacy and a lack of candor. Bill survived by his wife, Iris Edlin, and his daughter, Campbell Edlin, who's here tonight with us. My firm and I are very pleased that the Northern District and Ninth Circuit Historical Societies have founded an annual award in Bill's honor 
that's entitled the Bill Edlin Professionalism in the Law Award. Bill demonstrated on a daily basis how the practice of law should be meaningful and enriching, always striving for excellence. Bill was an exemplary legal profession, an even better person who loved the law and the judiciary. We would all do well to try to be like Bill. To win this award, you not only have to be an outstanding litigant, you need to have outstanding oral advocacy skills, trial skills, writing skills, a commitment to the judiciary and its institutions, and also be active in the community. You need to be supporting the community as part of your legal work. I'm pleased that the historical societies have established this award, and I look forward to seeing it presented to this year's recipient. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you especially to the Bartco firm for helping us with this and for continuing to honor Bill Edlin's legacy. I'd like to next introduce one of our Northern District judges who's in attendance, the Honorable John Tiger, obviously before being on the Northern District. Judge Tiger was a judge of the Alameda County Superior Court. And before that, he, I had the privilege of having him as a law partner of mine and many others at Kecker and Van Est. Judge Tiger. Thank you, Rigesh, and uh, I want to thank both historical societies for the opportunity to congratulate and honor my former law partner, John Kecker, on his receipt of this award. I'd like to talk about just a few of the qualities that set John apart from the other lawyers I know and the other people I know. I first met John Kecker in 1994, and I'm 60 years old. Among tonight's speakers, that makes me the most junior member of the group by either measure. <clears throat> the first thing I want to tell you is that John Kecker is a lawyer's lawyer. I won't spend much time on this point because all of you already know this about John. There isn't anything about the practice of law that John Kecker doesn't know or isn't good at. He has a mind like a steel trap. He understands the importance of having a story to tell in every case and taking every single opportunity to tell that story. And on top of that, he has superpowers that other lawyers don't have. For example, more than 20 years ago, he was trying a case with Elliot Peters, <clears throat> who's now a named partner at the firm, but who was at that time, I think, a junior partner. John got up to cross-examine one of the government's witnesses. It was a white collar criminal case. Now, one of the cardinal rules of cross-examination for the two of you in the room who don't practice law is don't ask the witness a question if you don't know what the answer is. Otherwise, the witness might give testimony that hurts your client, and there's nothing you can do about it. In this particular cross-examination, however, John violated that rule over and over again but the witness made concession after concession that was great for John's case. When John sat back down at council, excuse me, when John sat back down at council table, Elliot leaned over and said, Sato Voce, how on earth did you know to do that? And John just shrugged and said, I thought he'd give it to me. Having telepathic insight into what a witness is going to say is only one of John's many superpowers. John Kecker is also very erudite. He knows more about history than most tenured college history professors. Those who have seen the painting in Napole of Napoleon in his office get some clue about that. John once gave a list of book recommendations to a mutual friend of ours who's here tonight, which the friend passed along to me. I'll tell you about only two of the books, which will give you the flavor of the list. And by the way, I've read both these books and they're both excellent. The first is a book by the historian Hugh Thomas. It's called Conquest, Cortez, Montezuma, and the Fall of Old Mexico. The book is 832 pages long. The Alibris website summarizes the book as follows. After setting out from Spain against explicit instructions in 1519, 
Some 500 conquistadors destroyed their ships and fought their way towards the capital of the greatest empire of the new world. When they finally reached Tenochtitlan, the huge city on Lake Texcoco, they were given a courtly welcome by Montezuma, who believed them to be gods. Their later abduction of the emperor, their withdrawal, and the final destruction of the city make the conquest one of the most enthralling and tragic episodes in world history. The second book I remember is called The Ghosts of Canae, Hannibal and the Darkest Hour of the Roman Republic. The book was written by historian Robert O'Connell, and it is a relatively modest 337 pages long. The New York Times Review had this to say, other battles are perhaps just as famous, Thermopylae, Waterloo, Gettysburg, but the aura of Canae, where Hannibal obliterated the largest army the Roman Republic had ever put into the field, is unmatched. The battle is unparalleled for its carnage, with more men from a single army killed on that one day, August 2nd, 216 BC, than on any other day on any other European battlefield. Something like 50,000 Romans died, two and a half times the number of British soldiers who fell on the first day of the Somme. So John's not a guy who reads airport bookstore mysteries to relax. But that's not all. Does anything about the description of these two books stand out to you? Like the words battle, obliterated, destruction, carnage? Are you perhaps perceiving a common theme? Which brings me to the next quality I associate with John. He loves fighting. He absolutely loves fighting. He's not afraid. He's not worried. He's happy because he's in his element. And if John Kecker is your lawyer, you could not possibly have a more committed, fearless, and relentless advocate. The fourth quality, and one I find particularly endearing, is that John Kecker is incredibly blunt. And he uses it to his advantage. When he was representing Univision in a trial against Televisa in federal court in Los Angeles, the Kecker team booked the Omni Hotel on the condition that the Omni not allow lawyers from the other side's law firm to stay there. <laughs> Opposing counsel was a lawyer named Marshall Grossman who made a stink about it with the judge. Grossman had a point because the Omni was at that time the only decent hotel near the courthouse. When Judge Gutierrez seemed bothered by it and said, come on, Mr. Kecker, really? John stood up and said, Your Honor, I can barely stand to look at Marshall Grossman in court. <laughs> if I have to see him in my bathrobe, it's going to be all over. Judge Gutierrez cracked up and the whole issue was over. The last quality is what a role model and leader and mentor John is. <clears throat> If you uh, practice with John Kecker, then you felt like you grew up in the law with him. Once when I was a mere associate at KVN, one of John's clients told me I wasn't being enough of a jerk to the other side. And we got into an argument. The argument got heated, and I did something which is very uncharacteristic for me. I actually started yelling at the client. Uh, when the argument was over, I immediately regretted having raised my voice, and I ran to John's office right away, and I told him what I'd done, so he would hear about it from me first. John's only response was, he probably deserved it. He said, in this law firm, we don't win cases by being jerks. We win cases by being smarter than the other side. Uh, I've continued to teach that lesson to every law clerk I've ever had. <clears throat> anyway, that tells you everything you need to know about why John Kecker deserves to receive the Edlund, the Edlund Award tonight. Uh, John, it's an honor to pay tribute to you tonight to acknowledge the extraordinary place you hold in the profession and in this legal community. 
and to count myself among the legal family you helped raise up in the profession. Congratulations. Thank you, Judge Tiger. Uh, and next, I'd like to call upon Steve Taylor uh, to come up and give us some remarks. Steve is a lawyer that I've known. He was, uh, I, I've been told he was a law clerk in this district before I got here. Uh, he's practiced in this district at the highest levels himself for many, many years. I think I first met Steve in 1997 when John called me into his office and said that we were going to be co-counseling with Steve on a case, and I was a kid associate, and I sort of looked at him, and he said, you'll like Steve. He's a good lawyer. He could be a partner here if he wanted to. He just doesn't want to. <laughs> Steve Taylor. Thanks, Richard. Um, nice to see you all. John um, and I have been lucky enough to do a bunch of things together with some very interesting people, and I thought I'd just share this story tonight of just one of those. Uh, so the interesting person who's part of this story is not a lawyer, not a judge, it was a military guy. Um, actually, a fellow named Chuck, Chuck Boyd, and Chuck Boyd was a fighter pilot, uh, flew in Vietnam on his 88th mission. He was shot down, captured, became a prisoner of war, and remained a prisoner of war in North Vietnam for 2,488 days which when you calculate it is very close to seven years. Chuck got out, a uh, wonderful wife waited for him the whole time and sort of nursed him back to health and well-being mentally and physically. And then he went on with a career in the United States Air Force that was really remarkable. Retiring as a four-star general, retiring as the deputy commander of the United States European Command, overseeing activities in 82 different countries. Um, just a remarkable person. And then after he retired, and this is when John and I met him, he was an expert on national security and headed up a couple of organizations, including one called Business Executives of National Security. And uh, in that group, and John and I met Chuck then, he, he traveled with business people mostly and a couple of lawyers like John and I everywhere to like Bosnia and Serbia and, and Romania and John, I think, went to Ar Armenia and, and Azerbaijan and uh, who knows everywhere. We went to 20 countries together and got to know each other very well. So Chuck Boyd and John Kecker and Steve Taylor were good friends. We liked each other a lot. And one day, John, Chuck called and he says to me and John, um, hey, guys, there's an event in New York uh, that I'm going to be at, and I think maybe you, you, you might be interested in it. I just you want to join me. I'd really appreciate that. He said something to do with some Medal of Honor or something, and uh, it's going to be at the New York Stock Exchange building. And I don't know if you guys would join me, bring your wives, bring Tina and Lori, and that would be great, and we'd all do it together. So John and I said, uh, sure, let's, let's go do it. Uh, we went to New York. And then we arrive at the building, and I'm telling you, this event was something else. You arrive at the building, and cocktails were served on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'd never been down there with the huge trading desks and the monitors going up to the sky, the very place where you saw people, you know, tearing up tickets and yelling at each other. It was awesome. And mingling around the floor, every once in a while, I'd see somebody with a drink, but they had a coat and tie on, but they had this really pale blue neck ribbon a little thing hanging down below it. And I said to myself, that, that must be the Medal of Honor. I've never seen a Medal of Honor before. But sure enough, there are Medal of Honor recipients walking around the floor uh, saying hello to people. And uh, it was uh, astonishing. And then we go to a big banquet hall adjacent to the floor. And there are 30 to 40 tables. There's a big stage. There's a big video screen. Everybody that's sitting at their table John, Tina, Lori, and I are all together, and um, there's a guest sitting at our table for one of those pale blue ribbons, <laughs> and on our placemat is a, a, a little story about what that person did to win the little blue ribbon with the medal, and uh, that's true at every table on the floor of this big banquet hall. So we sat down, and I, I don't remember if it was Tom Brokaw or somebody was the master of ceremonies. There's incredible inspirational 
kind of program, very moving, very patriotic. And towards the end of dinner, they call on Chuck Boyd, our buddy, and they asked Chuck to make a few remarks. And we, I didn't even have an idea that Chuck was gonna make remarks, much less what it was gonna be about. And Chuck um, stands up and says that he's honored, but he's also embarrassed because she's surrounded by all these American heroes and he's not one. He's, he's far from being anything close to any of the heroes that are in the audience. But he says to the group, he would, if they'd indulge him, I'd like to explain or describe what his view of an American hero is. And so let me just tell you. So an American hero, the, the, the person, the kind of person I have in mind is someone who gets into a good Ivy League school and goes there on a Navy ROTC scholarship, thinking that he's going to be a Navy pilot when school is over and get out of school. But as you get closer to graduation, the Navy says, no, nah, you're not going to be a pilot. You're going to go and sit in a submarine for four years. So this person goes, well, I don't think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to enlist in the United States Marines, and I'm going to go down to Quantico, and I'm going to do the officer candidate school, and I'm going to see where that takes me. He marries his longtime high school and, 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 and college girlfriend, goes down to Quantico with three or 400 other people all trying to be second lieutenants um, in the Marine Corps and does pretty well. Finishes right at the top of the whole group. Becomes a second lieutenant, then gets assigned to, to a platoon and has 40, 50, 60 you know, Marines that he's responsible for. And sure enough, they get shipped to Vietnam. They, it's an infantry platoon, so they get involved in combat. And one of the combat missions, the, this, this person that I consider to be a hero gets wounded and then ultimately comes back to the States and after some serious amount of medical care and rehab, decides he's going to go to law school. And picks Yale, goes to Yale, to law school, and uh, does pretty well. Then uh, clerks for Earl Warren, the retired Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. People are kind of listening to, to, to Chuck as he's talking about it. And then it's not too long after that, um, he gets a job offer in San Francisco. He gets a job offer to be a, in the Northern District of California's Public Defender's Office, a federal public defender's office. He says, okay, he moves to California with his wife and his kid and um, becomes a federal public defender and tries cases, lots of cases, likes it, is good at it, Chuck says, and decides that uh, when this is all over, rather than going to one of the big prestigious firms in San Francisco, he may just go to a smaller firm with a couple other people and see what he can make happen that way and try cases, criminal cases, civil cases, any cases like that. And he becomes uh, successful, uh, wins a few cases, and then pretty soon is trying cases for some of the most prominent individuals and corporations in the country uh, and uh, very high profile cases. Now, at this point, at our table, I'm going like, he's not mentioned any names. I have no idea what he's up to, where this is going to go. But he's talking about John, and I don't know what's going to happen here. And um, the only thing I did was just catch a glimpse of Tina, who was sitting next to me. And Tina, God bless her, is wiping a tear from her eye. I'm sure remembering the journey, and I hope congratulating herself for how much she contributed to all of the success that Chuck Boyd was talking about that night. So Chuck goes on and explains how successful this person became as a as a lawyer and as a trial lawyer and how many contributions the person made to the community and how many commissions he sat on and what, caring about other people and, and how committed this person, this American hero in Chuck's mind was to his family and his two sons and their families and his grandkids. And uh, nationally, yeah. how, much, how much this particular person would done and would do for veterans. Um, and then Chuck says, the thing that really distinguished this American hero, he still has not mentioned any names or said anything, is this is a person who just relentlessly moved forward, did not look back, did not let the past in any way hold him back, was relentlessly focused on what really mattered, not just in the courtroom, but in life, and in the fact of just moving forward and saying, what is next when nothing was going to stop him? And he said, Chuck says to this group of 
I don't know how many Medal of Honor recipients. So that's my idea uh, of what American hero is, and that's what gives me hope and optimism for the future. Sits down, big round of applause, no names, no introductions. And we go like, unbelievable. He just told John Kecker's entire bio, bio to this group of 30, 40, I don't know how many Medal of Honor recipients there were there. And people were astonished and stunned. Now, Lori and Tina and John and I didn't say a word after that was over with. It was a kind of a remarkable event. We just, uh, and we have never talked about it since. And I've never shared this story with anybody else. But I share it with you all for a couple of reasons. First, Chuck can't be here because uh, Chuck passed away earlier this year. Um, secondly, the character traits that Chuck was talking about that night are many of the same traits that have made John so successful as a, as a trial lawyer. Um, but also because what Chuck said echoes something that I've said to one or two very, very close friends um, that I'll now share with John and with you all, and that is that I said to a couple of people who I'm very close to that, gosh darn it, John Kecker, for as good as a trial lawyer he is, and he is maybe the best, one of the best, uh, who, who knows how you rank him, but for as good a trial lawyer as he is, and he's great, the more you get to know him, John Kecker is actually an even better person, human being, and friend. So I congratulate you, John, and uh, I thank you. And I thank all of you for letting me share uh, that story. Thanks a lot. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome John's longtime law partner, uh, name partner, and uh, if I remember the story correctly, the original associate at the firm that is now now known as Kecker Van Est and Peters uh, was Kecker and Van Est when I joined it, Bob Van Est. Thank you, Rajesh. Welcome everyone, good evening. Um, members of the society, assembled judges, honored guests, and all you guys out in Zoom land, um, we're sorry you can't be with us tonight, but it's wonderful to see so many people here to honor John. And uh, of course, I am thrilled too. Uh, I have had the privilege of practicing law with John for 43 years, and man, it has sailed by. It has sailed by. So let me begin with the headline, some of which you may suspect. What we love and admire about John as a lawyer are his fighting spirit, his direct irreverent style, his capacity for commanding a courtroom, and his absolute dedication to clients. Those are the things that define John, and we all know it. Now, when you talk to lawyers, clients, sometimes adversaries, they use words like tough, aggressive, difficult, yeah, difficult, unrelenting, and dangerous. He can cross-examine anyone. And as you guys know, John, his longtime friend and partner, Bill, wrote the book on cross-examination. And so many of us have been privileged to see it uh, time and time again. So it's no surprise that John is at his happiest and most effective in the courtroom rather than in a settlement conference or God forbid, a meet and confer. Don't even invite him. Now, John himself has described his job as that of a warrior. He's used those words, and, and all of us doing trial work, as a warrior whose mission it is, whose mission it is to defend your client to the last, last possibility. That's it. And uh, I will talk more in a moment about John's history in meet and confer. Um, now, the committee asked me to recap John's remarkable bio, and you've heard a lot of it tonight. Thank you, Steve and John, uh, for recapping that. But I want to fill in uh, uh, just, a few, just a few spots. So you heard that John married his high school sweetheart, Tina Kecker. Uh, that was right after he got out of Princeton. 
and they had two wonderful sons, Adam and Nathan, and Adam is here tonight with his wife, Amanda, and two of John's grandchildren, uh, Owen and Elena. Welcome, guys. It's great to have you here. Nathan Kecker was not able to be here, um, uh, unfortunately, with us tonight. Now, John, after he got back from Vietnam, he, according to him, he went up to Yale, still with his arm in a sling. John was wounded in Vietnam. He had his elbow shot off and was evacuated back to Bethesda. Now, according to him, he went up to Yale. He met with the dean. He had the arm in a sling. He talked for 10 minutes, and the dean said, John, you're in. What an application process, right? Now, John, I'm sure that sling was a great uh, prop, but in fact, you probably had pretty good grades at Princeton, too. Uh, and so uh, he did have the privilege of clerking for one of the great chief justices, Earl Warren. But thankfully, John has never asked for that exorbitant Supreme Court clerkship bonus that we've all uh, come to pay. So, so thank you, John, for that, too. Now, at Yale, of course, John met Bill Brockett his lifelong friend and law partner. And with Bill, in 1978, John founded the law firm of Kecker and Brockett here in San Francisco. He had been a public defender with the great Jim Hewitt, the very first public defender in our district for many years. And by the time I got here, John was already established as one of the leading trial lawyers in town. And the law clerks all knew, hey, if you want to watch how a trial is done, go watch John Kecker. That's the way to do it. And so, so we did. Now, as the firm was getting started, John and Bill had the great idea that John should run for public office. This may have been our very first marketing event, John. And so he ran for a seat on the Board of Supervisors, David. Um, now, I know that if John's friends, Willie Brown or Nancy Pelosi, had run the campaign, who knows, you may have been in the White House today, John. Unfortunately, but fortunately for us, John and Bill ran the campaign. And so John Molinari, John's uh, opponent from a longtime San Francisco family, won. Now, looking back on that, that campaign seemed to be a series of lawsuits directed at the Molinari campaign. You may have been ahead of your time with these election lawsuits, John. Uh, but fortunately, once the politics bug got out of his system, John's legal career took off. And as Steve and John both said, he's been a leader in our community and nationally for 50 years. Uh, anywhere you go in the United States, you wanna talk about trial lawyers, John's name is at the head of the list. And he has handled some of the toughest cases. And I wanna just recap some of the names I know you guys remember who are all here with friends, but going back, Eldridge Cleaver, a Black Panther, Soul on Ice, George Lucas, Andy Fastow from Enron, Patrick Hallinan, Another great trial lawyer from our district here. Frank Quatrone from Silicon Valley. Claire Maglica for her fair share of the Maglite Flashlight Company. That was one of the first trials broadcast on Court TV. John, my mom and her friends were glued to the set every day. Cheering on Claire. Dad, not so much. Um, but that was a wonderful thing. Lance Armstrong, Governor Gavin Newsom as a target of the recall campaign. And of course, we the people too, all of us, in John's classic prosecution of the Reagan administration and Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. What a wonderful thing that was. Now, when Trump was elected in 2016, John gathered up the firm and he said, guys, we need some tough lawyers to keep this guy in line. And so we did. Uh, with John's guidance, we went out and challenged the Muslim travel ban, the attack on sanctuary cities, the denial of access to women's health rights, and a whole bunch of other things. And thanks to some of the great judges in our district, we prevailed on all of those. And thank you, Judge Tiger and Judge Oreck and others that handled those cases. I know John's proud of all that. Now, he's also served our city, president of the police commission, president of the fire commission, the uh, Presidio Trust. So John's done a ton of non-political public service, and we're very glad about that. But I have to admit <clears throat> that when Kathleen called me and told me about this honor, I was a little bit troubled because she said, this is the William Edland 
award for civility in the profession. And I thought to myself, wow, uh, civility is a big word, but not one that we often associate with John. Um, so I, I, and I want to back that up with just a few examples, just so you know that, that, that I'm on the straight and narrow. Now, now, many years ago, John called out one federal prosecutor who was only seeking a, a trial continuance for, for the government. He called him out in the DJ as a, quote, chicken shit bleep bleep who was afraid to try the case, unquote. John not likely to lead to a collegial working relationship. That's for sure. In 2012, in an SEC trial, he referred to the prosecutor as a, quote, rabid dog, and his evidence reminded John of Where's Waldo? Kids, that reading with grandpa finally paid off. Where's Waldo? In 2013, referring again to a prosecutor, he asked Judge Breyer, I guess in the form of an objection, is there some way to limit the lies that come out of this man's mouth and are making me sick? Objection overruled. Um, he referred to that prosecutor's evidence in a flattering way, too, as a stinking carcass that even wild animals will step around. Now, all this led one longtime federal judge in New York to say, Mr. Kecker, you remind me of a fire hydrant in summertime. On and on and on, and I cannot shut you off. We gave John a fire hydrant, but I, I figured I might have trouble getting it through security on the way in. So you get the idea. John's uh, contributions to civility are what you would expect from those of a warrior. But on a serious note, I, I, I knew Bill Edlin. We all knew Bill Edlin. And I know Bill would be extremely proud that John is getting this award tonight. Like John, Bill was a fierce advocate that put his clients first, always. We all miss and admire Bill, Michael, and he was a great example of what lawyers should be. So, John, on behalf of all of us, and especially those of us back at the firm, you're an inspirational leader. You've been a great mentor and friend to all of us, and we're looking forward to many more years of law practice together. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And next, to present the award to John, I would call upon our own uh, from the board of our historical society and the person who every year takes this award committee in hand and guides us uh, to a very thorough and well-deliberated and correct result, Judge Alsop. Thank you. John. Please come up here and, and join me. As he's coming up, let's give him his well-deserved applause. A room full of people that love you. And we're so honored to have you here tonight. My remarks are going to be very short because my job is to present the award. And where's Kathleen? Uh, please come forward, Kathleen. Uh, I want to make, uh, give, give me 30 seconds. Uh, you, you brought out a memory. In the mid 70s, we met. The first time we met was at a house party in the avenues and he had just decided to open his own firm and I can't tell you how exuberant and confident he was. He was leaving the federal public defender and there was no doubt in his mind where he was headed in the practice in San Francisco. He pulled out of his pocket a thing that you were supposed to put into your shower. Remember that? Of course. <laughs> And this was his campaign to get elected to the, because we were in a drought. And his idea was give one of these to every household and put it in your shower. And it's a little constrictor that would 
slow down the flow of the water. Remember that? Use less. Uh, use less. And I was, I said, how can this guy lose? This is brilliant. And so that uh, was my first uh, introduction. And it was quite clear to me that you were going to succeed. And you have in a fabulous way. And it's a privilege to, to give this award to you tonight, John. I want to just remind the audience what the criteria are for the Edlin Award. Excellence as a lawyer, both in written as well as oral advocacy. Civility, notwithstanding Bob Van Ness and those stories. Civility, commitment to the legal profession. And finally, leadership in the community. We have for you, I hope I say this correctly, uh, a platter. Yes. I don't know which is up, but uh, yeah. it, how do, do we open yeah. it now? Let's well, open it, it now. It's bubble wrapped to within an oh. inch of its life, but it's something from a wonderful little shop in your neighborhood called the Wordy. I know uh, the Wordy very well. And we are hoping you will use it for good health and happiness at your place up in Hillsburg with your beloved, beautiful family and all of your friends who, as the judge said, love you very much. There's no question. Thank you very much. All right. Shall I open There is a plaque that has your name on it now, engraved that will live here at the Ninth Circuit. Right. Um, that it will be, you know, for all time here um, with your name and the name of the other Edlin Award recipient. Fantastic! What an honor. I'm going to leave this bubble wrap. Um, man, I mean, I must say, this is over the top. Um, thank you so much, Judge Tiger, Steve, Bob, for those fulsome introductions. I wish they'd gone on longer. Um, and I, I'm when I was listening, I was reminded of uh, T.S. Eliot's quip that um, uh, humility is the most difficult of all the virtues because nothing dies harder than the desire to think well of oneself. Um, so, but I am deeply honored uh, to receive the Bill Edlin Award for Professionalism from the Ninth Circuit Historical Society and the Northern District S Historical Society. I'm particularly honored that all of you have shown up, federal and state judges, great old friends, uh, longtime friends and colleagues, my son Adam and his family, Three of the grandchildren are in college, but the ones who aren't are here. Um, and and it's, it's just a stunning event for me. Um, the, the, uh, the other person that I think is, uh, it's amazing that she's here, is Cammie Edlin, Cam Campbell Edlin, who was from Boston, out here on business, and had an opportunity to be here and wanted to be here. So I'm greatly honored by that. I knew and admired Bill Edlin, uh, having first met him at a, at a uh, Northern District Judicial Conference that was held in Kauai. And what I remember about it is it was that it was quite an experience to be there with 200 federal judges in Aloha shirts. It was unusual for a young lawyer. But you've already heard a lot of history. I'm going to give you a little bit more if you will stand it. Personal history about my 51 years practicing in this district. Start with my arrival in San Francisco in 1971. Uh, it was inauspicious. The mover who took our furniture from Washington out here char had underestimated and wanted another $500. Uh, so I went to the Bank of America, Fisherman's Wharf Branch, and said uh, I needed $500. I explained that I'd graduated from Princeton. I explained that I was first in my lieutenant's class in the Marine Corps. I explained that I was 
uh, wounded in Vietnam, had a disability pension. I explained that I'd gone to Yale Law School and, and uh, clerk for Chief Justice, retired Chief Justice Earl Warren. I explained that I had a job with a federal public defender paying the grand total of $11,000 a, a, a year. And that my wife and I, I had one a wife and a child and another one on the way. The manager told me that I didn't meet Bank of, of America guidelines and to get my father to sign for a $500 loan. I told her that I was going to be somebody in this town someday, and I was going to bring down the Bank of America. Then the Bank of America skedaddled out of town to Charlotte before I got the chance to bring it down. Tina sold her uh, grandmother's ring to pay the 500 to pay the mover. Things got better after that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My days at the Federal Public Defender's Office were glorious. <clears throat> the U.S. Attorney's Office at that time, and we're honored to have our next U.S. Attorney with us today, Izzy Ramsey. All he has to do is a little thing getting approved by the Senate. But, um, the, but the, at, in those days, the, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office was prosecuting everything that moved. Bank robberies, counterfeit checks, stolen Social Security checks, uh, small drug cases, even the, uh, I tried the, the first hijacking case after the, uh, the FBI decided they weren't going to let the planes take off. They were going to come on board and shoot it out with the bad guys and without regard to how many passengers were blown away. I tried that case before Judge Schweigert and lost, of course. Um, as a federal public defender, I thought I would never win a case. My first case, just as an exemplar, was, uh, and I see Bill Osterhout back there, he's had these experiences too. The, my first case was for a guy named Spencer Goodlow, who was a 20 year old. He'd already been in state prison. What he'd learned in state prison was that what you should do is rob federal banks because the tellers are instructed to give you the money. And so he, he decided he was gonna do that. Um, he gave it a try, he got the money, but after that, things didn't go well. The teller identified him, he was arrested outside the bank with the money in his pocket. His handwriting was on the demand note, and he confessed. Uh, I asked Jim Hewitt, the beloved Jim Hewitt, the federal public defender, how to defend such a case. And Jim said, argue reasonable doubt, and then he went on vacation. Uh, I had a wonderful time as a federal public defender trying lots of cases and finally winning some. It was a life-changing experience for me because it convinced me that I wanted to be a trial lawyer, notwithstanding this little dip into politics, which, thank God, I lost. Um, I left the federal public defender after two years to strike out on my own. In San, in San Francisco at that time, uh, big firms were very conservative. Uh, the, the conventional wisdom that was that you cannot start a firm in San Francisco. If you wanted to start a firm, go to Santa Rosa or go to San Jose. But I didn't want to leave San Francisco, so I started with two others, Steve Kipperman and Joel Sean, Kipperman, Sean, and Kecker. And then that became Kipperman, Sean, Kecker, and Brockett when my great friend Bill Brockett joined us um, a, a little bit later. We had little paying business, but boy, did we have a good time. We sued the CIA, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, the Contra Costa County Flood Control District, the Department of Corrections, the city and county of San Francisco, and, and of course, Henry Kissinger. Needless to say, not all of those cases were successful. Uh, I also represented, as has been mentioned, Eldridge Cleaver, who had jumped bail and now is back facing the music in Alameda County. Bill Brockett represented the Alaska Teamsters, who were always in trouble. Um, in 1978, Bill and I broke off to start Kecker and Brockett. Our announcement read, specializing in business litigation and complex criminal cases. By complex, we meant cases where the client could pay. We were very fortunate to make Bob Van Est an early hire, and thanks to the generosity of other lawyers and top talent like Bob, we thrived. 
by in 1981, three years after we started the firm, we were on the cover of the American Lawyer under the title of Great Small Firms. As with everything else, you know this, luck had a lot to do with our success. When we started, the big firms looked down on criminal defense. They had no expertise in it, sort of scared them. They were completely unprepared for the explosion in white collar cases that happened in the 70s. Big firms could refer criminal cases to us because we were so small without any fear that we would take their corporate work or keep the client. Uh, and we went from representing bank robbers to bank, representing bank presidents and later with the addition of some terrific young lawyers moved into all kinds of um, high stakes commercial litigation. One of the things that has struck me, and I, I bet a lot of you too, uh, is, and I've been grateful for is and amazed by the generosity of other lawyers, people doing things for another lawyer without asking anything in return. To name a few of my uh, great mentors and, and helpers, Larry Poposky, who, who ran the litigation group at uh, Heller Ehrman, sent us lots of clients, including Warren Hellman. That's how we started working for Warren Hellman. Charlie Renfrew, who was still on the, on the uh, district court, told people we were great trial lawyers. Jim Brosnahan, who I think is watching by Zoom, uh, who was helping turn Morrison and Forrester into a powerhouse firm, referred clients to us. So did Ed Heafy from across the bay at the firm that was then known as Crosby, Heafy, Roach, and May. They never asked anything in return. They just wanted us to do a good job for their clients or for the client that they'd sent, the person that they were referring. I found that wonderful, generous, and awe-inspiring. And I hope it's still going on today, and I try to do that myself. Uh, I was fortunate to live in a time when the economy, especially in Silicon Valley, exploded, imploded, exploded. It was like being a, uh, and creating all kinds of litigation. Uh, it was like being a Honda dealer in the 80s, where they just, you know, you could sell anything. Um, our two-man firm has now grown to 120 lawyers under one roof, trying cases all over the country, and I'm very proud of that. Generosity from others who wanted nothing in return also led to my role in the Iran-Contra affair. Judge Lawrence Walsh, who was the independent counsel, uh, in, in 1986 was appointed. He needed to assemble a staff quickly. He'd been a district court judge in New York, and he'd also been deputy attorney general uh, under President Eisenhower. Charlie Renfrew had served in both those positions. Judge Walsh also had been president of the American Bar Association, and as had Bob Raven, who was the great leader of Morrison Forrester's growth and achievement back then. Both Charlie and Bob recommended me to Judge Walsh, uh, who hired me. I arrived in Washington to the astonishment of the FBI agents who wondered why, why is a criminal defense lawyer from San Francisco, particularly uh, amongst all these FBI agents? Uh, I got to know and admire Judge Walsh. While returning periodically to San Francisco, I tried a couple of uh, criminal cases, federal criminal cases, and I tried one five-month-long libel trial in Alameda County against University of California um, during that time. But when the time came to indict North and others, I assured Judge Walsh that District Judge Gerhard Gazelle, who's presiding over all the stuff, would never grant a severance to the defendants. And of course, I was wrong. So the first trial was that of Oliver North. And Judge Walsh asked me, asked, Judge Walsh asked me to try it with him. After planning how to try the case, it became obvious to me, at least, that Judge Walsh, who hadn't tried a case in years, and I would not be able to agree on tactics or strategy or really much of anything. Uh, I told Judge Walsh that I followed Napoleon's adage of unity of command and Napoleon's insistence that one bad general is better than two good generals. And I resigned my position and came home to San Francisco. A few days later, Judge Walsh called and turned the trial over to me. 
It was the only time I've ever been a prosecutor. The trial was hard fought, much publicized, resulted in a conviction of North that the DC circuit reversed on the grounds that grand jurors might have been exposed to immunized testimony that North had given to Congress. After Iran Contra, I returned to San Francisco to grow the firm with Bill Brockett, Bob Van Est, and other terrific partners, some of whom are here today. And we did grow. We were lucky that intellectual property uh, was just transitioning from court trials by specialist lawyers to jury trials with jury lawyers um, who were more skilled in explaining complex evidence to juries. Our firm was the beneficiary of that change, leading to a robust pat patent, trade secret, copyright, antitrust practice. At the same time, we continued our specialty of white collar defense, handling cases all over the country, and I'm actually very proud of this, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Minnesota, New York, Nevada, Washington, Colorado, and of course, all districts in, in California trying to answer the question, well, do you think you need a local person? Uh, we tried cases all over. During all this work, I've been blessed with great partners, honest, hardworking, and collaborative, unselfish, and of course, smart as hell. Uh, having had a lucky and happy career as a lawyer, preparing to accept this award, the Bill Edlin Award, which is a great honor, uh, led me to reflect on what I've learned, if anything. Uh, and so one thing I've learned is a lot about myself, uh, but I have to bear in mind Oscar Wilde's belief that only the shallow know themselves. Um, I have learned that trial practice fits my personality and character. I have an empirical bent. I prefer facts to theories. Uh, I prefer skepticism to either idealism or cynicism. And I believe that justice with a capital J is in the eye of the beholder. And also that a world without mercy would be an abomination. Every trial is a new challenge. You have to be brave to try cases. You all know that. Judges can be scary. Uh, juries are really scary. Losing is devastating. It's always a personal rejection. I've learned that to try cases uh, requires collaboration with people you trust, and I love the teamwork that that brings about. For people who are good at it, trial practice is still great work. Trials are about power, conflict, control, all subjects that continue to fascinate mankind. Trials are problem solving uh, with the understanding that sometimes that means creating problems for other people in order to solve your problem. And the work is creative. You, you uh, lost bound by tradition and it, resistant to innovation, but trial lawyers uh, can make their own rules. Trial practice has changed so much in the last 50 years that I worry about its survival. You all have all heard these statistics about the number in federal court, only 0.3% of civil cases go to a jury trial. In federal criminal cases, only 2% are tried by a jury. The rest are settled, plea bargained, mediated, arbitrated, or dismissed on motion. But those gloomy statistics, at least I consider them gloomy, uh, don't tell the whole story, at least in the Bay Area. We've been blessed with great trial lawyers here and many great judges, both state and federal, who love trials. When I started, Jake Ehrlich, Vincent Hallinan, James Martin McGinnis, Penny Cooper, Charles Gary, uh, Clint White, were still all raising hell. Uh, they've been followed by new generations of fine trial lawyers, more diverse, but no less able. My firm alone has had 13 trials or arbitrations this year. So I, I refuse to be discouraged and believe that trials are here to stay. The world will be a far less interesting place if all disputes are settled by polite mediation and plea bargaining. For maladjusted souls like me who love the chance to channel aggression into a socially acceptable pursuit, 
trials with their ability to educate, vindicate, and amuse are a great blessing. Thank you again to the Historical Societies of the Ninth Circuit and the Northern District of California. Thank you, Kathleen Winters, for all the work you and Alex have done on this. Thank you, Judge Alsop, for calling me and telling me about this award. Uh, and thank all of you for being here.